Hello church family, this is your pastor and this is your midweek update. I hope this video finds you doing well. I'm excited about studying God's Word together with you uh, today. Now before we get into our study on Psalm 119, I have a few important things I want to remind you of, some important and exciting things I want to remind you about. First of all, this coming Sunday, which is August 16th, we will uh, return to one service on campus. We added a service uh, when we started back meeting on campus in June. We added a service to try to keep people spread out, but we feel like that with our current social distancing measures, uh, we can accommodate everyone in one service at our 1030 hour. And so this Sunday, everyone will be back together at 1030 in our uh, worship center. Now, for those that aren't quite comfortable yet getting out, we will continue to offer the live streams. You can tune in and worship along with us. Uh, but just keep in mind, there will be one service starting this Sunday on August 16th. Also, as we think about phasing in other ministries, uh, some, there's some more exciting information. Uh, the school starts back at the end of this month, and then we get uh, into Labor Day weekend. But the following weekend, which is September 13th, the following Sunday, September 13th, we will um, begin uh, again to have Bible studies on our campus uh, during the 9 o'clock hour. We'll begin uh, preschool ministry, uh, children's ministry, student ministry, adult Bible studies. It will be wonderful, and we can't wait. Also, on that Sunday, we'll begin to have children's worship again during the 1030 hour, along with uh, preschool ministry during that hour. So we're, we're excited about phasing Bible study hour back in, and, and we are asking God to lead us and guide us in that. Also, that following Wednesday, which is September 16th, we will begin to phase back in midweek ministry on our campus. Here's what that entails. We won't have a meal at 5 o'clock. We'll, we'll wait and see how things go before we start eating together again. Uh, but we will meet at 6 o'clock. And during the 6 o'clock hour, uh, we'll have preschool ministry. We'll have children's ministry. We'll have youth worship led by our new student pastor, Jared Green. And we'll have adult Bible study. And we'll meet for adult Bible study in our sanctuary so we can, again, keep people spread out. And we will study God's Word and pray together during that 6 o'clock hour starting again on September 16th. Until that time comes, we'll continue to offer the midweek video update, but we again are excited about phasing in ministries and asking for God's hand of protection and guidance on our church and on our lives. So th those are some, some things for us to look forward to, a target for us to shoot at, and we can't wait to see what God does. So you, you be praying about that and, and considering your role in that. Also, another important announcement on uh, August 23rd, that's not this coming Sunday, but the next Sunday, immediately following the service, which will be at 1030, we'll take a brief pause and then we will reconvene for just a few minutes for a church conference. We've got a matter that we want to share with you. We'll give you more information about that, uh, that, about that matter this weekend, about some ways we can move forward as a church. So in some of our uh, weekend um information that goes out through email and through other means, we will give you the info that you need to be ready uh, for that church conference on August 23rd. So just want to uh, make you aware of that. More details soon to follow. Now we are in Psalm 119. Psalm 119. We are excited about this study. We're calling it Saturated with Scripture because that's really what this psalm is about. It's a call to be saturated with God's Word. And this psalm is a wonderful psalm. It's, it's beautiful. It's beautiful in its redundancy. Uh, every verse in this psalm, with the exception of three verses, directly mentions the Word of God in some way, shape, or form. So we are, again, uh, we feel the, the, the waves of of this focus on the Word of God, washing over our lives, reminding us that we need God's Word. We need to be saturated with Scripture. And also, this psalm is beautiful in its organization. This is a Hebrew acrostic poem, which means it is, it is highly organized. Uh, the different sections are 
are, are, um, are organized around the Hebrew alphabet. The first section starts with the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet. The second start, section starts with the second letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And it goes like that through the entire psalm. And not only does each section start with a different letter of the Hebrew alphabet, the particular section that is, that is, um, that is related to a, a Hebrew letter, uh, every verse in that section starts with that same letter. So, for example, uh, tonight we're studying the Gimel stroke. Gimel is the third letter in the Hebrew alphabet. And so in verse 17, it starts with the Hebrew letter Gimel. But verse 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, they all begin with the letter Gimel. If you looked at this in a Hebrew Bible, you would see that same character being used. So it's very organized and, and it's beautiful in its, in its organization. Uh, it, it's beautiful in its length. It's 176 verses. It, it's long, but it is, it is powerful, uh, again, because of the themes that are driven home into our lives. And so I love Psalm 119, and I love studying, studying it together with you. Now, we've studied the Olive Strophe. Strophe is the uh, word for the uh, section of poetry, and Olive is the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And in verses 1 through 8, we studied... Uh, that section that, that each verse begins with the Hebrew letter Aleph. And, and then last week we studied the Beit strophe. It starts with the second letter of the Hebrew alphabet in verses 9 through 16. Now we've made it to the Gimel strophe. The Gimel strophe, third letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And, and I want to read it and then we'll go back and, and make some comments and, and share some insights from this section of Psalm 119. Uh, notice there in verse 17, the, the heading is Gimel. Hebrew letter, deal bountifully with your servant that I may live and keep your word. Open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of your law. I am a sojourner on the earth. Hide not your commandments from me. My soul is consumed with longing for your rules at all times. You rebuke the insolent, accursed ones who wander from your commandments. Take away from me scorn and contempt, for I have kept your testimonies. Even though princes sit plotting against me, your servant will meditate on your statutes. Your testimonies are my delight. They are my counselors. This is a powerful passage of Scripture. Now, Warren Wiersbe, in his commentary on Psalm 119, highlights something interesting here about the posture of the psalmist. The psalmist here considers himself and and all those that are followers of the one true God, those that ascribe to the Lord and His Word in in three different ways. Uh, The first is is he considers himself a servant. Look in verse 17. He says, deal bountifully with your servant. And so he considers himself a servant of God. God is his Lord, his master. He He is designed to serve his Lord. But also... He considers himself a student there in verse 18. Open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of your law. The, the psalmist here wants to learn God's word. He's a student of God word, God's word. But, but Wearsby also points out that the psalmist here considers himself a stranger. Look in verse 19. Verse 19, he says, I am a sojourner on the earth. Hide not your commandments from me. And so the psalmist understands that he's a citizen of the kingdom of God. This world was not, was not his home. He was just passing through on his way back into the embrace of God in heaven. So the psalmist here considers himself a, a servant, a student, and a stranger or a sojourner. Now that means that Jesus... Uh, was his master, the Lord was his master, the Bible was his authority, and the world was not his home. That is true of us as Christ followers. If we are followers of Jesus Christ, we have that same uh, posture as believers. Uh, Jesus is our Lord. Uh, The Bible is our authority. This world is not our home. We are just passing through. We're not meant to get comfortable here. We're we're here to to transform the world as as salt and light. Uh, But... These realities, Jesus as Lord, the Bible as authority, uh, this world's not our home, these realities put us at odds with the world. And, and often as, as believers in Jesus, as followers of the one true God, the world will, will press in on you. And as Paul says in Romans chapter 12, will attempt to, to 
to press you into a mold that you might be conformed to the ways of this world. Ralph Waldo Emerson famously said that for nonconformity, the world whips you with its displeasure. So when you are following Jesus, you're a servant of King Jesus, you're living according to the word, you, you are not... You are not tied to the things of this world. You're just passing through as a stranger, as an alien, as a sojourner. The world will not like that. It will not like the way that you are living. And you might experience people, maybe in your family, maybe in your workplace, maybe acquaintances or through different relationships, but you will experience people pressing in on you, displeased at the way that you're living. And the goal is to try to get you conformed to the ways of this world. And the psalmist here is experiencing this. The psalmist here is experiencing this pressure from the world. In fact, in verse 23, he says, uh, princes sit plotting against me. And so he feels that, that those in the world who were opposed to the ways of God were pressing in on him to get him to conform. And so really this psalm is about how the word of God helps us to keep on keeping on in this world without conforming. That's what this psalm is about. And that's an important word because we are pressured, again, to conform. We're, we're pressured to, to lay down our principles and our convictions to, to fall in step with the ways of this world. And that doesn't honor the Lord. And so this section of Psalm 119, the Gimel strophe, really gives us some insight into how we navigate that. How we live in this world as aliens and strangers without being conformed to this world. And, and you might not be surprised to realize that the Word of God is key in living a life of, of non-conformity as you walk through this world. And so I want to give you three thoughts as, as you and I, as we journey through this world with its dangers, toils, and snares. And again, these are all related to the Word of God. Number one, as we journey through this world, we need our eyes opened to truth and beauty. We need our eyes opened to truth and beauty. Now look what the psalmist says there in verse uh, 18. Open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of your law. The, the psalmist feels surrounded by those who are enemies of God, pressing in. And the psalmist here says, as I feel this pressure, as I journey through this world with its dangers and toils and snares, I need my eyes open. I need to understand what, what the truth is from God's Word. And I, I need to see the beauty of who God is from His Word. So the psalmist makes a request, open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things from your law. This is a great verse to memorize Almost every time I read the Bible in my time alone with God, I breathe this prayer right before I start reading. Lord, open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things from your law. Show me what you want to show me from my reading of the scriptures today. And God will certainly answer that prayer. But notice here, the psalmist here wants to see wondrous things. Open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things. Now, what do we find in the Word of God that is wondrous, that is wonderful? Well, there's, there's a lot, but let me give you two quick examples. First of all, God's works are wonderful. God's works are wonderful. Look over in Psalm 107, Psalm 107, verse 8. The Bible says, Let them thank the Lord for His steadfast love, for His wondrous works to the children of man. Now, look in verse 15 of that same psalm. Let them thank the Lord for His steadfast love, for His wondrous works to the children of man. So in Psalm 107, the works of God are called wondrous. They're called wonderful. So when we pray, open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things from your law, certainly we're asking God, show us the wonder of your works. And as you read the Bible, you see the works of God on full display. We're reminded of how God formed uh, the, and created the, the universe with just His Word, the power of His Word. We see how God formed a, a nation through Abraham and his descendants and preserved that nation and protected that nation, even through their disobedience, so that one day through that nation He could send a Messiah who would come to suffer and die and rise again and reign forever. And, and all of those works are 
unfold through the scriptures. We see his works on display. We see things like God uh, causing fire to fall from heaven when Elijah prayed on that Mount Carmel in the showdown with the prophets of Baal. We see God parting the waters of the Red Sea so Moses and Israelites could could pass through on dry land and then he destroyed uh, Pharaoh's army. We see the walls of Jericho falling down. We see a, a great fish swallowing Jonah to get his attention. I mean, on and on and on. We can talk about the wondrous works of God, all the different ways that he has moved through human history uh, to be the to to be our redeemer and our savior. So God's works are wonderful, but God's love is wonderful. God's love is wonderful. In Psalm thirty-one, verse twenty-one, Psalm thirty-one, verse twenty-one. Listen to what the Bible says about God's love. Psalm thirty-one, verse twenty-one. Blessed be the Lord, for He has wondrously shown His steadfast love to me. And so the psalmist here makes the connection that, that God's love is wondrous. God's love is wonderful. And as we read the Bible, God opens our eyes to the reality that the creator of the universe, the one who spoke the universe into existence, also loves us. The Bible reminds us that he knows us by name. He knows how many hairs are on our head. And in spite of our sin and our rebellion, He loves us. And His love is on display in God's Word. And as we read the Word of God, our eyes are opened again and again and again. Not only to God's works, but God's love. And, and we can go on and on about the wondrous things God shows us. But, but notice here, in the midst of, of being surrounded by the ungodly, the psalmist here says, I want my eyes open, Psalm 119, I want my eyes open to wondrous things. I want to know the truth of who God is and how God works and what God calls us to do. And I, I want to see the beauty of our God. This world offers so many counterfeits and I want to be enraptured by the beauty of my great God and His will and His way. I like what Charles Spurgeon says about this verse in his wonderful uh, commentary called The Treasury of David, which is all about the Psalms. He writes about this request to have to see wondrous things in God's law. He, the psalmist, felt that God had laid up great bounties in His Word, and he begs for power to perceive, appreciate, and enjoy the same. We need so, not so much that God should give us more benefits as the ability to see what He has given. The prayer implies a conscious Darkness, a dimness of spiritual vision, a powerlessness that that removes that defect, and a full a powerless a powerlessness to remove that defect, and a full assurance that God can remove it. It shows also that the writer knew that there were vast treasures in the Word which he had not yet fully seen. And I want to just highlight that: no matter how long you've been a Christian. No matter how long you've been learning God's Word, you need to understand there are still vast treasures in the Word of God that you have not seen uh, fully and clearly yet. You'll spend uh, the rest of your life and all of eternity digging into the riches of the Word of God. And so he says, he shows also this request that the writer knew that there were vast treasures in the Word which he had not yet fully seen, marvels which he had not yet beheld, mysteries which he had scarcely believed. The scriptures teem with marvels, Spurgeon writes. The Bible is wonderland. It not only relates miracles, but it is itself a world of wonders. Yet what are these to closed eyes? In other words, there's so much in the Bible, but if your eyes are closed, you won't see it. You won't see the truth and beauty of the scriptures. And so as we are surrounded by ungodliness, as we are surrounded by things that are that are impure and and um, and, and, and things that are not of the Lord, we need to fix our eyes on things that are true and things that are beautiful. And that happens as we engage the Word of God, saturated with the Scripture, and God opens the eyes of our hearts to see the truths of Scripture. Now, we'll talk some more about the opening of the eyes and the, the gift of illumination and how that works uh, in, in more technical sense as we journey through Psalm 119. But right now, I just love this, this prayer request. Open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things from your law. So as we journey through this world with its dangers, toils, and stairs, we need our eyes open to truth and beauty. Secondly, as we journey through this world, we need to focus on what's best for our life. 
We need to focus on what's best for our life. Verse 20, the Bible says, My soul is consumed with longing for your rules at all times. You rebuke the insolent, accursed ones who wander from your commandments. Take away from me scorn and contempt, for I have kept your testimony. So the psalmist here is saying that I want to stay on the right path. I'm consumed with keeping your rules. I want to I keep your testimonies. I don't want to go down the path that, that others have gone down. He mentions the scorn and contempt that comes from, from ignoring the Word of God and going your own way. He's saying, I want to stay on the right path. I want to fervently, diligently, consistently keep your rules, your principles, your precepts. I want to keep your Word. I want to live in obedience. Now, if you're watching this and you struggle with obedience in some area in your life and you struggle with the idea of obeying the Lord and in learning God's Word so you can obey the Lord and, and, and obedience is really not front and center, can I just remind you that God made you? And can I remind you that God knows what's best for you because He's the one that made you? And when He gives us commandments, things to do, things not to do, He gives us commandments because He knows what's best for us. That's why it says over in 1 John chapter 5, that His commandments are not burdensome. He doesn't give us commandments to weigh us down and take away our fun. He gives us commandments because He knows what's best. And the psalmist gets that. He, the psalmist feels this pressure to conform to the ways of the world. He's surrounded by ungodly influence. So he's saying, I want to be consumed with longing for your rules. I know that you know, God, what's best for me. And because you know what's best for me, I want to keep your rules. I want to keep your commands. I want to do the right thing. We need to focus on what's best for our life. Now, over in the book of Proverbs, there's an interesting verse or passage of Scripture uh, in chapter 1 directed at those who ignore God's commandments, who ignore God's uh, Word and the wisdom that comes from God's Word. And in Proverbs chapter 1, verse 24, the Lord is speaking to those who ignore His will and His way. And He says there in verse 24, this is wisdom speaking, wisdom from God's Word speaking to those who ignore Him. He says, Be, Because I've called you and you refuse to listen, you have stretched out my hand and no one has heeded, because you've ignored all my counsel and would not have none of my reproof. I will also laugh at your calamity. I will mock when terror strikes you. When terror strikes you like a storm, your calamity comes like a whirlwind. When distress and anguish come upon you, then they will call upon me, but I will not answer. They will seek me diligently, but will not find me. Because they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord, would have none of my counsel and despised all of my reproof. Therefore, listen, here's the consequence. When you ignore God's word, here's the consequence. Therefore, they shall eat the fruit of their way and have their fill of their own devices. For the simple are killed by their turning away and the complacency of fools destroys them. But... Whoever listens to me will dwell secure and will be at ease without dread of disaster. So uh, Proverbs reminds us, if you ignore God's law, if you ignore God's word, if you ignore God's commandments, you are headed for heartache. You are headed for calamity. But if you will listen to God's word, because you know God's word is best for you to keep God's word is what's best for your life, that God knows what he's doing when he speaks, that, that God made you and knows what's best for you. If you will keep God's word, the, the Bible says you will dwell secure. So as I journey through this world with its dangers, toils, and snares, I need my eyes open to truth and beauty, and I need to focus on what's best for my life. But third and last, I experience God's presence through God's word. You know, it, it can be hard when you're surrounded by ungodliness. It can be hard when when those who do not love the Lord are pressing in on you because you are not conforming to the ways of this world, to the ways of ungodliness and unrighteousness. And it can be hard. It can even be lonely. You might have people in your life that have turned their back upon you because you have chosen to follow Christ and live a life that honors Him. And it can be hard when when people keep their distance from you because you're trying to live for Jesus. and It can be downright lonely and, and, and it can feel isolating. And the psalmist experienced this. So, so notice how the psalmist deals with the isolation that is brought on by his de desire to keep the word when it seems like no one else was. Listen to what the psalmist says there in verse 22, uh, Psalm 119. 
Take away from me scorn and contempt. This is the scorn and contempt coming from the ungodly who are against him. He says, Take away from me scorn and contempt, for I have kept your testimonies. Even though princes, those in authority, even though princes sit plotting against me, your servant will meditate on your statutes. Your testimonies are my delight. They are my counselors. The psalmist is in effect saying this. Even though everyone has turned their back on me, even though people who are of importance are plotting against me because of my desire to live for you, he's saying, I don't have to, to be alone. I don't have to feel isolated because I have you, God, and I experience you through your word. He, he mentions there being delighted by his testimonies, verse 24, delighted by God's, by God's word, God's testimonies, which is another phrase for God's word and, and and your word they're my counsel your words are my counselors through this life so the psalmist here is saying this even if everyone else turns their back upon me I have your word as my constant companion through life and as I engage your word as I become more and more saturated with scripture I experience you in the midst of that as I walk through the word of God I am I am I am walking with you who gave us this Bible. And so the psalmist here feels this, this awesome sense of the presence of God as he clings to the Word of God in the midst of isolation brought on by his own desire to live a life of nonconformity in a world that was pressing in on him. It may become increasingly difficult. I think it already is, but in the coming days it may become even more increasingly difficult to live for Jesus in this decaying society. We can expect hardship that comes just from being faithful followers of Christ. But isn't it comforting to know that even if we feel the, the pain of, of, of that, the persecution that may come because we're following Jesus when our Society is disintegrating. Isn't it comforting to know that when we have the Word of God, we can meet God in the pages of Scripture and experience His presence in real and fresh ways every day? It's interesting that when you read accounts of, of those who maybe have been thrown in prison for preaching Jesus, like pastors in communist China, for example, and they, they've been thrown into prison for, for standing for Jesus and preaching the gospel, that that they find some way to get the Word of God or they write the Word of God down on scraps of paper and hide it in their cell. And they're so comforted by the Word of God as they are in captivity. Even though they are isolated and alone, as they engage the Scriptures, they know that God, they're reminded God is there with them. The Bible becomes, there in a jail cell, becomes their delight. The Bible is their counselor even in the midst of persecution. And so, we can experience God's presence through God's Word. So, it can be hard to live for Jesus when many around us are not. And as we journey through this world with its dangers, toils, and snares, we need our eyes open to truth and beauty that happens as we are saturated with Scripture. We need to focus on what's best for our lives. And that happens as we are saturated with Scripture. And we need to experience God's presence through God's Word. And that happens when we are saturated with Scripture. So I love this strophe. I, I love this section of Psalm 119. And, and hopefully you've come away from this study with, with that uh, 18th verse on your heart. Hopefully you and I will pray much in the coming days. Open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things from your law. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we're grateful for your word, a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path. And God, I pray that you would use this study to give us a, a deeper hunger for the word of God in our daily lives. And Lord, as we engage the scriptures as we are saturated with scriptures, would you mold us and make us into faithful followers of Jesus who make a difference in 
this world. And we'll thank you and praise you for that grace. Lord, there's much going on in, in our world today, much that we need to pray about. And God, uh, the forefront of our hearts and minds is the ongoing pandemic, coronavirus, and how that's affecting our country, our world, our community, our church, our families, our schools. God, I just pray for wisdom for all of those in leadership, Lord, on the local level, on the state level, the national level. God, would you give leadership to those that are making important decisions, uh, guidance, wisdom, insight. God, put wise counselors in the paths of our leaders and, and give them ears to heed that wide, wise counsel so that we will take appropriate steps uh, to, to mitigate uh, the, the risks that come from uh, the spread of, of, of COVID-19, but also, uh, Lord, uh, figure out how to move forward in ways that are healthy for, for, our, for our people, for our, for our economy, for our um, families. Uh, Lord, give our leaders great wisdom to navigate that. God, I pray for our healthcare professionals on the front lines. God, that you keep them safe and give them wisdom and insight. God, we pray for a vaccine for COVID-19. God, would you provide that? And would you provide it in a, in a, in a, in a rapid manner? Uh, a vaccine that works, a vaccine that is effective, Lord. Uh, God, would you provide that? And, and God, ultimately, we pray you would, you would take COVID-19 away. Uh, God, that you would just move in a, in a supernatural way to, to cause this, uh, the threat from this virus uh, to go away. Lord, I pray for those, uh, Lord, and uh, in, in, in first responders, our military, Lord, that are still serving, protecting, um, Lord, doing very important things. Uh, and the, the challenges are greater because of coronavirus. God, I pray you keep our first responders and military safe and encourage them in their roles and use them in mighty, mighty ways. And we will thank you for that grace. God, I pray for our church family. God, watch over our church. God, keep us uh, safe as we uh, phase back in ministries, God. Help us to be wise and help us to be uh, vigilant. Uh, and, and God, I just pray to watch over our church and, and help us to, to provide ministry that, that makes a difference. And God, I pray you would just pour out your favor upon our church. We need you. God, we need you. So help us, Lord, as we fix our eyes upon you to, 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 be, um, to be filled by your Spirit, that we might live lives of, of deep meaning and purpose, even during the challenges brought on by COVID-19. So God, watch over our church. Use our church in mighty, mighty ways. God, I pray for those in our church who are, who are sick, uh, Lord, we have many in our church who are struggling with different illnesses or recovering from different surgeries. God, I pray for your healing. I pray for your physical strength. I pray for your spiritual strength, uh, your emotional strength for them, God, that you would uh, raise them up and help them to see improvement in their different situations. God, I pray for those that have lost loved ones in our church family. There have been many. God, I pray for your comfort and peace and strength. God, j just draw near in a very special way and pour out your grace upon these these families. And we'll thank you, Lord, for that. We love you. We praise you again. We thank you for this time uh, to study your word. Uh, continue to move in our lives, Lord, by your grace, for your glory. Help us to fix our eyes upon Jesus, for it's in his great name that we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for tuning in tonight. Until we meet again, may the Lord richly bless you.